Matt is currently the animation supervisor at Mr. X in Adelaide. And he's going to give you an overview of his uh, 25 years in animation. Or being old. Younger, plus some. Um, and also go through a few techniques as well. Um, so just a bit of background. Matt and I met back in 2008 in London um, when I was recruiting for Animal Logic looking for animators or a whole slew of people for Legend of the Guardian, um, the Owls of Gahul, or as we just refer to it, Guardians. Um, so we met in 2008 in, in a hotel bar cafe um, back then. And while Matt was working on finishing up on the Tales of Despero for Framestore. Um, and then two years later, Matt came over to Australia to um, work on that project. But his career has uh, had started way before we met. Um, and so I'll throw it over to Matt to um, kick off. And like I said, everyone, if you've got any questions, feel free to pop it in. I think I, I was, I think when you interviewed me, I think you told me years later that you almost didn't hire me because I was so quiet. You were, yes. Because I was so, um, I was so shy. Uh, I'm, I am an extremely shy and reserved person naturally and I think it's taken me like 25 years to kind of figure out how to probably express myself to strangers and large rooms and groups of people and yeah looking back to that interview and, and the kind of person I was then and even at the start of my career where I was so reserved and so shy and so you know kind of inward looking where now I sometimes I do dailies with like a you know in a theatre full of people and I have to stand up and talk about their work and talk about the projects and things like that and but I'm still that kind of shy person that I was back then but I just kind of figured out how to you know kind of use that and, and talk to people um yeah so I can't believe it's been that long <laughs> and then I guess I think it was like nine years later, we, we were recruiting together um, for Lego Ninjago when you were That's right. a supervisor on that. So Yeah, so we were doing, yeah, we were then doing the interviews together. We did a lot. I think, we, I don't know, I don't know how many interviews we did, but we did a lot. A lot. Um, so, yeah, so let's go back to, let's go back to the, the start and let's go back to, to why I wanted to be an animator. And I'm, I can, I'm going to share my screen with you, Let's see if I can, um, is this going to work? Can I share this? Can I share this cartoon? So can you, can you see this, this cartoon here, this Gary Larson cartoon? Yes. Thumbs up, thank you. So when I was, um, when I was 15, I used to draw cartoons. And um, I, I used to take the, the bus, there was no internet back then, I used to take the bus into town. I used to basically go into greetings card shops and I used to um, look at the funniest cards and then turn them over and write down the address of the people that made the cards, um, take them home and then draw my cartoons and send batches of my ideas out to these companies that made these, um, that made these greetings cards. Uh, and after doing that again and again and again, eventually I got a check back and someone sent me some money for one of my drawings. And this was when I was, yeah, I was a teenager. Um, and I kind of realized that people would pay money for ideas. They would pay money for, for jokes and drawings. So that became um, my way of earning money at the time. I wasn't really into kind of, um, you know, working in a local pub and washing dishes. I thought, oh, I can... I can just be a cartoonist for a living. And that was the thing that, that kind of got me into um, kind of selling my creativity and, and realizing that there's actually a kind of market for being creative and people will give you money for what's in your head and for what you've got in your, in your brain. Um, so I, I, I did that for a while. I, I continued to write and draw jokes and that Gary Larson cartoon, that Gary Larson cars, basically cows something in the field and the car comes past and they'll go on all fours and the car disappears and they stand back up right on two legs again. 
that was kind of what I was sort of trying to emulate that style of that sense of humor really, really grabbed hold of me. And um, I just thought it would be easy. I thought the rest of my career, I'll just draw cartoons, sell them to newspapers and that will be my career. And I retire at 30 and um, job done, easy. Um, and, but life doesn't always work out quite like that. And you'll, you'll see as you kind of go through my career, you'll see there's a kind of theme and the theme is adaptability, I think. So I've kind of gone from learning different aspects of, of animation and filmmaking, uh, and I've kind of moved into various different kind of um, styles of doing that through my career to kind of always keep learning and always keep uh, adapting. So, um, so after, after drawing these cartoons for a while, I, uh, I studied art at school. I failed. I failed everything. I failed pretty much every single, um, every single thing I could study. I was a terrible student. I wasn't engaged. I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't really interested in what I was learning, and I, I just. I just really couldn't find what I wanted to do. And then I was. I was dating a girl at the time, and she was an incredible artist. Uh, and she got onto a course in Bournemouth and so I, I was in the UK and she got onto a course in Bournemouth, which is on the south coast by the beach in the UK. And I didn't want to split up with this girl. So I applied to the same college and I applied to um, the animation course because we were like, well, what can I do? What can I, what can I, what can I learn? And they're like, well, you like drawing cartoons. You're always drawing cartoons. You love reading comics. Why don't you apply to this animation course? So I applied, uh, I made a few flip books. I'm, uh, I grabbed hold of a, a, an old video camera and I made a little stop motion animation. And I, I, made a, I took a folio of all my drawings that I did at home. Um, the drawings that weren't really suitable for my, for my art classes at school. Um, and I went down to Bournemouth. And for some reason, they accepted me onto the course. Um, yeah, the teacher saw something in me that I'm not quite sure what it was, but there was something in these flip books or in this little stop motion animation that even though I didn't really have the, the grades or the results to get on the course, I had the folio and I had the, the personal work that, that appealed to the lecturer. And the lecturer was a guy called Peter Parr. And I think he was the first teacher that I had um, that kind of inspired me to, to want to be better and to want to keep learning. And, and he just gave so much to us as students that, that I think pretty much everyone who went through this course really, really got really inspired by him as a teacher. So we've all gone to various different places all over the world. Um, a friend of mine who was on the course with me, he's now a Google doodler. So he, he does all of the, whenever you go to Google's website and you see the little drawings on the website, uh, he does all of those. Um, I'm just going to close this window because it's distracting me. Um, so I spent two years studying animation. I studied um, traditional 2D animation. Um, there was one guy that did CG at the time. We had one computer on the whole course and there was one guy that used it all the time. But pretty much everyone else, we all did, uh, we all did 2D. So there was a lot of life drawing, life drawing every single day, pretty much. A lot of just sketchbooks. We had piles and piles and piles of sketchbooks and we were taught to be always drawing, always scribbling. And I've got, you know, pencil in front of me now and I've got a little doodle pad kind of down next to me. And I'm always kind of scribbling and doodling all the time. Um, so, yeah, so we did um, animation, 2D animation for two years and then there were four of us, we got hired by a little company that lived um, kind of in the middle of nowhere in the UK. And we finished the animation course, we graduated on the, on the Friday, we had like four days off and then we started our first job. Uh, they put us up in this little kind of country cottage out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and we started as 2D uh, in-betweeners doing TV, um, animation for a kids TV show. 
So we didn't really have a break in between. We just kind of graduated and then just got straight into it. And I haven't really stopped since. I've kind of just been going, going, going ever since I got this first opportunity. Uh, I think the longest break I've ever had is like about six weeks off. I've just been kind of constantly going ever since. So, hey Matt, um, can I just ask, how did you get that opportunity as an in-betweener? So they, uh, they came to visit the university that I was at. Um, so they came and they interviewed all of the, all of the students that were going to graduate. And we sat down with them, we presented our folios that we had at the time and our little line tests. And then they picked a few, as a, a few of us from, from that group. So I was lucky enough to be one of the, the chosen few from in that group. So it, it was an amazing opportunity in, in terms of, you know, industry coming to visit us and us having a chance to kind of show ourselves. Um, so, and we just grasped it, just went for it. And because at the time we got paid by the foot. So the, the more you drew, the more you would get paid because you were getting paid by the foot of film. Um, so we had light boxes with us. We took the light boxes into our little cottage out in the middle of nowhere. And when we weren't at work, we would draw all the way through the night. We would be working all the way through the night just to kind of keep going, keep drawing, keep earning money and just try to build up our portfolio and just keep, keep, keep going. Um, and it was great. It was a really good experience. I really enjoyed it. Um, but at the time, the 2D animation industry in, in the UK, especially, you know, it was really, really small. There wasn't a lot of work going around. Um, so the opportunity to, to stay employed and to, to keep that constant stream of income and to stay employed as an animator was really, really difficult. I managed for about a year to kind of keep working and keep going as a 2D animator, but I think I pretty quickly realized that 2D animation was going to be very difficult to, to sustain a long-term career. So this was kind of one of the big milestones, I think, for me in terms of making a decision to, to step to one side for a beat, take a look at what I'm doing, and, and reorganize my, my career in terms of what I want it to be. So I, I went back to live with my parents. Um, I pretty much locked myself in my, my bedroom at my parents' place and gave myself six months to change my portfolio, to change um, everything I had in terms of my showreel and try and um, get a job as a CG animator. So think about it at the time, there'd been no, maybe Toy Story had just come out, but there'd be, there was no real CG feature animation industry because Toy Story, Pixar, they were kind of just getting going. There was, there was companies like Framestore that were just starting to kind of introduce little bits of CG into their work, but there really wasn't that CG animation industry that there is now. But what there was, there was uh, in the UK, a computer games industry that was really starting to take, take off. So I thought, right, I want to be a CG animator, but how do I, how do I begin that career path? I'm going to aim my folio at computer games companies because I think that is the, the best way to, to become a CG animator. So I changed my folio to aim towards those companies. So all the 2D work I had is kind of like concept. I, I, I made new kind of concept work that would work with the kind of games that people were making and whether it was like fighting games or adventure games or whatever it was. Uh, I did some new little animation tests as well on my little home animation setup that I thought would be appropriate to computer games companies. And just like when I was doing my little cartoons when I was a teenager, I, I sent them, I sent it to everywhere. I wasn't looking beyond the UK. I was just thinking I was just trying to get a job, you know, in the UK at the time. But I sent it to every, every company I could find in the UK. And the only way to do that was to look in the back of computer games magazines and find the, the names of the companies, kind of like what I did with the cartoons um, that, were, that were making these games. And I just, again, I bombarded them. I took my work absolutely everywhere. And I got nothing back. 
no response, no one was biting. Every day I would, I would kind of come downstairs and, and check the post to see whether I got any replies to my, to my um, parcels that I sent out and I was getting nothing. But I, I gave myself six months to kind of get a foot in the door. And then there was one tiny little company just south of London and they replied to my, um, to my application. And basically they said, if you come and, and spend some time with us, if you can teach yourself siege animation, we'll give you a job. So, okay, great. So I went down to this uh, tiny little studio and they gave me, uh, it was called 3D Max. They gave me the, the, um, the manual of the 3D Max. They said, you've got two weeks. Yeah, no one's going to teach you because no one knew how to animate in the company. If you can figure it out, you've got a job. So I spent two weeks kind of <laughs> trying my head buried in this, um, in this manual. I'd never animated in CG before. I didn't know what IK or FK or constraints or, uh, you know, I didn't know how to, the fundamentals of kind of modeling or anything like that. I, I completely, um, completely green to the whole thing. So I spent two weeks with my head kind of buried in this ginormous, um, this ginormous manual. Um, and at the end of the two weeks, they gave me a job. I, I think I managed to create a really fundamental, pretty terrible piece of animation, but it moved. <laughs> it kind of looked like a, they were doing a fighting game. So I, I made this little character that, that would work within their fighting game. Um, there was no IK. So it was almost like a stop motion kind of rig where I was having to kind of reposition and counter animate everything for every single pose because there was no IK to kind of lock something in space. Um, so yeah, they gave me a, they gave me a go, which was yeah it was a it was a huge moment for me because I'd, I'd made that kind of leap from from two D animation uh, over into into CG. Um, so that this was kind of like my, my computer games little period of my career. So I spent a while working at this uh, games company, um, doing yeah pretty simple kind of low budget computer games, but I was learning all the time just about CG and about the principles of, of how you animate in CG and how I can take my skills that I've learned from 2D animation and my, my drawing skills that I'd learn and how I can apply that into, into animation, uh, into CG animation. So, so I went from there to uh, another computer games company, which was called Elixir Studios. And Elixir Studios was a startup animation company. It was a brand new thing. It was um, set up by a guy called Dennis Hassabis. And if you Google him, uh, he, went on to create a company called DeepMind. DeepMind is an AI company and he sold it to Google for about $450 million or something like that. So he's now fabulously rich and can retire a very wealthy guy. But at the time he was in his twenties, I was in my twenties and he was setting up this computer games company, big plans. We were going to take over the world and it was going to be this amazing experience and this amazing thing. So I was like, great, I'll, I'll have a piece of that. So I went to work with him, um, and it was, it was a very big learning curve for me because I was, I was still very young. I was still very naive. I was still, as I was saying to Patricia, very shy and reserved. Um, but I was, I was in charge of a little team of animators. I had to, I had to deliver work, uh, you know, on behalf of the, the animation side of the studio. And the studio was comprised of um, Cambridge graduate geniuses. So Dennis was a chess grandmaster at 13, an absolute proper genius. And he brought a whole load of his friends from Cambridge with him to start up this company. So we had this extremely clever technical aspect to the studio. And then we had this creative side that had to communicate with the technical side. And it didn't really work. And it was a, it was a really big learning point for me in terms of how do I communicate with different people on different levels in terms of what we're trying to achieve on the, the bigger picture of the project? So that, you know, sometimes the way that I will talk to a, a creative is 
different to the way that you'll talk to someone slightly more technical because it's you know different kind of conversations and different answers that each side is trying to trying to find and trying to achieve and you know at the end of the day we're all trying to solve the same problem which is to make this thing and release it and for it to be successful but I, I needed to learn how to communicate with all these different these different people um, ultimately the the games that we made weren't successful it was it was uh we reached for the stars and we didn't quite make it. In fact, we fell pretty far short. Um, but it, it was a it was a really good learning opportunity. There was a lot of, I think I did my first um, you know, twenty four hour shift at a company where you would go in in the morning and you wouldn't leave until the following day. We did all kinds of crazy hours, but it was it was great fun because we were all just pulling together to try and achieve, you know, something kind of cool. Um, but then I kind of got to the point, I think, where I wanted to, I wanted to become a better animator and I wanted to learn more about kind of, I wouldn't say filmmaking at the time, but I wanted to learn, learn more about the, anim the creative side of animation. And, you know, I was still in my early twenties and I was leading a group, but I didn't really feel like I was capable to lead a group because I didn't really know enough myself yet. So people were looking at me, you know, to provide answers. And that's not to say that anyone has the answers to everything and it's completely fine to not know the answer to solutions, but I, I, I don't think I was ready to, to be leading a, a group of people. Um, and I wanted to become a better animator. At the end of the day, I, I think I hadn't really spent enough time animating myself. So, so, what happened? I saw this video for um, this two, this animation pop group called Gorillas. And I, it was the first video that they released. And I saw it on TV or on MTV or whatever it was. And it just blew me away. I was like, I, who made that? I want to go and work with those people. That is just really good. How do I find out who made that? And, and how do I get there? So I did my research and I, I dug up the, the company behind uh, behind the, the video. They were in London, they're a company called Passion Pictures. Um, so again, I've done this several times in my career. I um, I took stock of what my, what my folio looked like. It was very games heavy. I didn't think it would be what Passion Pictures wanted to see. And before I applied to Passion, I spent a good amount of time creating new work specific to try and get that job. And I was very targeted, like that was the job that I wanted. Those were the people I wanted to work for. They were in London, they weren't too far away. And I felt it was like an achievable goal and I made it my pinpoint kind of thing to try and work for those people. Um, so I spent a whole bunch of time, again, getting my showreel ready, changing things, making it specific, um, putting some lip sync on there and doing some more acting pieces because my games reel was very action heavy and very dynamic, which is great. And I kept some of that on the reel, but what I didn't have was facial work and um, acting and performance. And I felt that would be what passion would be looking for. So did my thing, got myself ready, sent my work off, off to Passion, and waited and waited and waited. And eventually they, they replied and asked me to come in for an interview and I went in and I got a job, a freelance gig uh, on a commercial uh, for chocolate, it was a chocolate commercial. Um, and it meant, it meant leaving my full-time job to go and work as a freelancer which again was a big step, kind of big scary thing to do. I had a guaranteed income, regular paycheck, and I, I stepped away from that to basically go and do this kind of two week gig that could potentially end with no more work and then I would be out of a job and unable to pay my rent. But I just wanted to work with these people so much because of that music video, because I thought it was so great um, that I, I went for it and I gave it a go. So I worked on this uh, chocolate commercial. The chocolate commercial went really well. 
And at the end of the chocolate commercial, Passion offered to hire me full time. So I was I was so lucky that that they they picked me up and they gave me a full time job because of how well that commercial went. And again, because I think I put a lot into it, uh, and I was really willing to listen to the director and and really li- willing to listen to everyone around me in terms of what they wanted, and I gave it my all. Um, so I spent uh, about three years at Passion Pictures, um, and it was it was an amazing experience. Passion Pictures is like this kind of they do two D, they do CG, they do stop motion, they do commercials and music videos, and still to this day they're still running. They have an office in Paris, one in London, uh, one in Melbourne. Um, I think they used to have one in New York, but maybe not so anymore. Um, and the turnover of work was really, really quick. This was something I wasn't used to. So, you know, uh, a commercial would come in and in two months time, we had to deliver it and it had to be on TV. And it was that, okay, we need to figure out the, the quickest and best way to solve these problems and get something on screen and, and deliver it out of the door. So it taught me a lot about kind of um, really quick problem solving and, and really how to kind of figure out solutions and, and turn stuff around on the fly and turn animation around and turn concepts and ideas and things around very quickly to kind of then show to clients um, or show to the director or the producers or whoever to, to prove that we can do these jobs. Um, so there was, there was one job that I did. Let me see if I can share my screen again. Share. Um, so you, I don't know if you can see this with... Um, so this, this was a job that we did um, with Madonna at the, the Grammy Awards. This was in 2006, maybe. So, so I, I also kind of got my, my, my dream was to work for the people that made Gorillaz. And I, and I got the opportunity, I got to work on some of their music videos and, and do some of their live shows as well. So one thing I forgot to mention, when I was this um, teenage, kid growing my cartoons. My, my hero was an artist called Jamie Hewlett. Uh, Jamie Hewlett drew this comic called Atom Tan that I got at the time and these comics called Deadline and Tank Girl and things like that. And he was my idol. When I found out that he'd made the gorillas, that was another key thing for, for me in terms of really wanting to work with these people. So I got the opportunity. I got to, I got to work with him got to work with uh, Damon Albarn and um, the director of, of this and many other things at Passion is a guy called Pete Candeland, who's an Aussie, Aussie guy. He's in LA now working on feature films. Um, and Pete Candeland is a, is a genius. He can multitask. He can do like three commercials at once and have them all in his head and them all running. And he still somehow manages to kind of keep them all on track and understand what's needed. So this, this, um, live show that we did with Madonna. Uh, this was a, a really difficult job because basically it was a live performance. So Madonna is a hologram. This is all C- pre-rendered CG. Um, we, we did a test shoot in a, in a really grotty warehouse in London um, with Madonna. Uh, and she wanted to wear a black leotard. And we told her she couldn't because then she would just be like a floating head and a pair of legs. So we had to tell her that she had to change her costume, which she wasn't very happy about. So we did this, we did this kind of test run, this um, proof of concept of how are we going to make CG interact with live action, but live on stage. And for the people in the audience, for it to appeal, appear like she is actually there immersed with the, with the CG. And we came up with this solution of this kind of, this angled sheet that we would project the image onto with, a, with another image behind it so we could have the two things kind of interacting and she can, she can kind of walk in amongst the, um, the images. Um, so we, and the turnaround for this job was so, so short. We, we worked, I don't know, crazy, crazy, crazy hours because we had to, all of these individual pieces of animation were, all had to be um, 
like three minutes. How long is it before they disappear? Like three and a half minutes. So it, was, it was a single piece for animation of three and a half minutes for each character. Um, and we, we shared up the work by we divided each character in, in half. So there were two animators on each character, but then we would have a meet point in terms of our keyframes halfway through the show. So I animated uh, this guy, Murdoch. I did the back end. So my, my start point of his animation had to match the end point of the previous animator's uh, work, a guy called uh, Jesus, um, uh, Spanish guy. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun. We could be a bit silly and, um, and uh, have a lot of fun with it. Uh, it got a huge reaction. I think it was seen by like, I don't know, like a billion people around the world or something like that. It was, it was a big moment. Um, but we were working on this. We were working on this literally the night of the show. We, we went over to LA with, with hard drives and a, a couple of computers. We were, we were rendering this in the, the back room of, of the, the theater hours before it was about to go on live TV because it wasn't finished. <laughs> so it was a crazy time, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, you can see Murdoch doesn't have a guitar strap on his guitar. We just didn't have the time to, um, to add one on. So, <laughs> so Madonna comes on stage, she interacts with the CG, she goes off stage, and then she interacts with, um, with the live action performers and continues with her show. And Della Sol were in it too as well, I think. Yeah, Della Sol were in it uh, later. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, let me see if I can stop sharing. Um, yeah, so that was my time at Passion Pictures. Uh, about three years, did lots of commercials, improved my animation tremendously. I think one, because I was, I was turning around you know, so many jobs so quickly. Um, and I think, you know, there's that old, that kind of old rule of you need to do 10,000 hours or something to actually be any good at it. And I was kind of getting through my 10,000 hours, I think. Um, so we did, um, yeah, lots of lip sync, lots of performance. I worked with lots of different directors. So it was, it was a really good learning experience in terms of different directors want different things from a performance. No one wants the same style of animation. So it's different styles of animations for different directors for different jobs. So you're constantly having to kind of change slightly what you're trying to achieve and the kind of work you're trying to produce. Um, lots of crazy deadlines, lots of just working all night, all day, all night, all day. Um, but then at the, at the end of that, um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to improve again. Again, I think I, I felt I got to a stage where I'd kind of got as much as I could out of the commercials experience. And I wanted to kind of move on and, and do something, do something else. But kind of around about that time, I also started to create my own um, ideas and pitches for TV shows and, and things like that. And that's something I've kind of continued through my career and something I do now. So, so now um, I also executive produce movies and, and write movies and I do um, got various movies in development that I've kind of, I cover the rights to or I've kind of co-developed. And it's something I've kind of done uh, alongside a kind of regular job of my career. I kind of always do my own kind of bits and pieces as well, which I think is a, a, quite a good outlet as well as doing the, the paid work. It's good to sometimes create things for yourself. Um, and a good example of that. So towards the end of my time at Passion Pictures, I made this, um, I was listening to Ricky Gervais uh, on, on the radio and I took a little bit of his voice um, and I went home that night and, had a little sound bite of his voice and I made a little animation of, of him and uh, Stephen Merchant and this guy called uh, Carl Pilkington. And this was right at the start of when people were doing podcasts. They just kind of started to do the podcast. Um, the three of them and they were known as like the, the, the most downloaded podcast at the time. So uh, they were kind of quite 
popular. He just done the office, and the office was getting all kinds of awards. So I did this animation. Um, I, I found Ricky's agent uh, online because hey, the internet had arrived, um, and I sent I sent the the clip to his agent, and then thought nothing of it. And then about maybe a week later, I was at work at Passion, and at the time at Passion. If you got a phone call coming into the office, because um, it was quite a small building, they would just say over a little loudspeaker, oh, Matt Everett, you've got a phone call online too. And I was just working away on a, on a job. And they, over the tannoy, it said, oh, Matt Everett, Ricky Gervais is on line, line two or whatever it was. I'm like, what, Ricky Gervais? So, so I picked it up and he was like, hi, it's Ricky. I just saw your animation. I think it's great. Um, do you want to come over and have a chat? And they were literally just around the corner from where uh, Passion was. So I was like, okay. So I put my coat on straight away, walked around the corner, buzzed this door. He opens the door and him and Stephen Merchant were sat there and they were like, come on in. And, and they said, we thought your little clip was great. Uh, what's your pitch? What do you want to do with it? And I didn't have a pitch. I didn't have any idea. <laughs> I, I just made it for the fun of it and sent it because I thought you might like it. And on the spot, I, I just came up with this pitch for a TV show. I was like, oh, you could, we can make it like an animated DJ show, but for MTV where you're animated characters and you come on in between all of the music videos and, and it's like, you know, little, almost like a kind of Beavis and Butthead kind of thing. Uh, and Ricky was like, great, let's do it. So I kind of walked out and I was like, did that really happen? Uh, I went away and I, I made more little clips and I put together a pitch package. And Ricky set me up with a um, meeting at MTV because he was, you know, big wig at the time and he can just do that. And he sent me off. He said, good luck. <laughs> and I went off to MTV and I pitched them my TV show. Um, and for, for various reasons, the, the show never actually made it to air. We, discussed it for a while and there's various things that, that happened that made it didn't quite make it but it was it was my first experience of, of pitching uh, a TV show to a, to a company and I've gone, gone on to do various different pitches for different things through the years but it kind of shows you the benefit of of sharing your work with people and not being too protective of your work you know and not feeling like something has to be perfect before you share it it's completely okay to to you know, send rough ideas out in, into the world and and share different things and and get the feedback on it and accept the feedback on it for what it is, and then use it and try and make your work better. And I've always had that, you know, this kind of running theme I think through my career of, of creating things and then putting them out there and sharing them with people. Um, and literally, this week um, I got a, a meeting on an option on a a book um, for a, that I want to turn into a movie um, and I'm having a meeting with, the, with the, the agent in New York. I'm staying up until like midnight on Friday to talk to the agent to talk about getting the rights for this book because I, I just enjoy creating things. I, I enjoy, you know, developing projects and um, talking to different people about different ideas, learning about different people's processes and the way that they work, how they come at different things. Um, and the, the, the book that we're hoping to produce is one that my daughter read and she was like, Dad, this would be a great film. So I read it and I agreed and we're going to try and make it into a movie. And that's something that we did with a with previous book a couple of years ago, which um, we wrote the script for and developed and also looking to, to shoot uh, fairly soon. Um, so yeah, so this was just rewind all the way back to, to Passion Pictures. So. I had that experience with Ricky and I went on to work with him on, on various different things. Sometimes he would just show up at, at, at the office and buzz the door and he'd just go, Matt, I've got an idea for this thing. How do we do this? And I would go for a coffee with him and I'd say, well, if you want to make that as an animated movie, then you have to do this and it's going to cost you this much and you need this amount of time. And he'd kind of go, okay, great, great. Okay. And he'd go away and then he'd come back with another idea. So. It was a lot of fun and he was, he was very gracious in terms of giving me opportunities to, um, to express myself and, and, and share my work with people. Um, so I was at Passion for three years-ish. 
but then I, again, I wanted to move on and I wanted to improve. I wanted to get better. And uh, Framestore were about to embark on their first animated feature film. So there'd been, there was a movie called Space Jam that happened in London uh, back at the start of my career. But apart from that, there hadn't really been many animated features going through London. Not as many as there are now. I mean, there, there just generally weren't as many movies being made as there are now back then. Um, but Framestore, who were, you know, already a big company with really, really good reputation, they were going to make an animated feature, which was called The Tale of Despero. Um, and they got in touch and they offered me a job. Um, so I, I went for it. I took, I took that job. And again, it, it, was, it was going back from just being an animator on my own, looking at my own screen and working away to looking after a team. So I was an animation lead. So I had 12 animators that I would look after. We had you know, several teams, each team has a lead and then an animation supervisor or an animation director. So I was going to be an animation lead on the town of Despero. Um, and it was kind of taking in, you know, all the different parts of experience of my career so far in terms of, you know, the experience making games where I was leading a small team, but then felt like I wasn't quite ready to those experiences of working at Passion Pictures and doing, you know, the, the quick turnaround of jobs and the lip sync and things like that. Um, but working on an animated feature, the amount of time you have to investigate and explore and workshop ideas is, it feels like everything takes a lifetime. After being in commercials where everything's like, go, 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 doing animated feature, you just feel like, why aren't we just working quicker? Why aren't we just like, turning this around faster we can do it faster because in commercials you do everything fast but in animated features everything has to go up the chain all the way to the director and then the, the people that employ the director the studio and the producers you know every note goes all the way up and then it gets filtered all the way back down again and then you do the note and you send it off and you wait and it goes all the way up and it comes all the way back down again so to begin with i just like had to kind of slow down a little bit and just Coming around, okay, I need to change the, the flow and the pace of the way that I work. And it is something that takes a while to get used to, that kind of slow rhythm of animated features, because you have to kind of wait for all the other departments also to do their thing. Um, and I think sometimes when you first get in the industry, <coughs> you feel like, why aren't things moving quicker? And why aren't decisions happening quicker? And why are those decisions even being made? They don't seem sometimes decisions seem strange and the kind of the longer you spend in the industry and the, and the higher you go up the chain the more that you realize that the decisions aren't just based on that one department or that one shot or that one asset you know the decisions go spread across the whole movie and they involve you know a lot of different people with a lot of different vested interests in that movie you know the studio wants to make their money back on it the, the vendor doing the work wants to make money, but they want to also turn around a good product. And the, the director wants this kind of, um, you know, aesthetic, but the studio won't make, give the director that much money. And there's all these different things that go on that you suddenly kind of realize that's why everything takes so much time because there's so many people with points of view and uh, invested interests in the project. Um, so we worked, worked on Despero for about two years, maybe. Not quite sure, I'm not very good with dates and times, a little bit of a blur. Um, but it, it was good, it was, it was tricky because Framestore historically had been a VFX house and VFX and animated features have a different way of doing things, have different pipelines, different approaches. They, they set up their teams differently um, and Framestore took a, a while to kind of get out of this VFX mindset into this animated feature mindset. Uh, quite often on a, on a VFX show, you have VFX supervisors and the VFX supervisor is the person that talks to the client. On an animated feature, you don't really call the people you're working for the client. You're kind of more all in it together. You, 
often don't have a VFX supervisor, often you just have the, the supervisors of the departments deal directly with the director. Um, so there's kind of slightly different ways that, that the two different um, formats shift. Um, and also just in terms of for animated features, you're making assets that have to survive over hundreds and hundreds of shots. You know, you're making a central character that might appear in, in almost every shot of the movie. And that, that asset and that character has to be able to perform and survive, you know, all the way through that, through that film. Whereas on VFX, you know, sometimes a, a vendor might just be given a package of shots, which is, you know, it's got an asset that is only needed for, for 50 shots. It just needs to survive those 50 shots and do its job for those 50 shots. So you'd be, you'd be thinking a lot more shot based rather than kind of sequence based and, and kind of, you know, the entire movie based. Um, but French Store was good and it was good to get back into, into dealing with looking after a team. It was, it was good to learn more about how to be a filmmaker. I think that's when I kind of started to make that shift from being an animator to understanding how to make a film. How to, how to compose a, a shot, how to compose a sequence, how to tell a story over a number of shots, how to put something, you know, in, in, a, in a shot 10 minutes in that is then going to pay off 60 minutes later when you, when you down towards the back end of the film. Um, so, uh, you know, animated features is definitely a a good place to learn all those filmmaking techniques. You know, I was given the opportunity to actually, you know, get hold of the camera and and compose shots and set up shots and and it kind of makes you realise how much there is to learn. I think, um, you know, doing commercials, you, you, you kind of just zoned in in terms of what that commercial needs, but you're not really thinking more about, you know, thematic structure or, or you know, the, the cinematography or the style of shooting of, of something over a two hour period. It's more specific to just selling that product because that's what we're doing at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of a, a big milestone, frame store. And that's when Patricia, Patricia came to London to interview for Animal Logic. Um, and it was, a, it was a weird time in London so at the time in London, uh, the Harry Potter movies were going. They weren't at the end of their cycle yet, but Harry Potter kind of kept the London film industry afloat for quite a lot of years. And we've got a lot to thank for Harry Potter. Those books and the, the success of those films, they kind of created this industry in the UK, in London, that is still there to this day in terms of there's so many VFX shops in Soho in London. You, you walk out of the door and, and you turn right and two doors down, there's another VFX house and you go into the street and there's another VFX house. Everyone's making movies and commercials and music videos and there's so much creativity going on in this tiny little space in London. Um, and from the VFX side, a lot of that is, uh, is down to Harry Potter. But when I finished Tale of Despero, there was no Harry Potter and it, it was like, there was almost like nothing going on in the industry. There was just, it was just like, where's all the work gone? And there was this huge industry of people and we, we'd all finished a lot of jobs at the same time. And we were all looking for work at the same time. And we kind of came up from working on Despero and a few other people came up from working on a few other jobs, looked around and there was kind of like no work in London. And I think that was the first time that I ever really thought about working outside the UK and the, the potential to work outside the UK because Animal Logic had just done uh, the first Happy Feet, which had been a huge success on the Monosca. Um, the, the industry in the US was growing. There was um, companies around Europe starting to grow. So there was like Ilion and places like that. And it, it was almost like, the, the industry was starting to spread out a little bit and the opportunities for employment were starting to spread out as well, which, you know, as you get into the industry, you, you realise this is kind of, 
the the workforce kind of moves around the globe and the 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 companies move around the globe looking for the tax breaks so i'm in adelaide right now and the reason i'm in adelaide is because we have the best tax incentives in the world so we're, there's a studio here because this is a good place to be because people want to spend their vfx budget in this city because they also get a rebate on every dollar they spend it's the same for montreal it's the same for london and the, the industry kind of moved out of los angeles because la wouldn't provide those rebates they wouldn't provide those tax offsets so the industry is kind of well where do we go we're going to vancouver we're going to montreal we'll go to um, we'll go to sydney in australia which also has you know great opportunities um but then the the industry the the workforce the animation workforce move around the globe following that work and if you want to travel you want to see the world and you want to get people to pay for your flights and once we're through covid fingers crossed and the world gets a little bit more back to normal then that opportunity is there because you know companies they will say well we'll, we'll give you a we'll pay for your flight and we'll, we'll fly you over and we'll put you up for a couple of weeks where you get settled and then, then you can come and work on the show and you know that opportunity especially the higher you go up the ladder is is there for people to kind of move you around the globe for me now i'm not that keen on moving around i've got family and we're quite happily settled but at the time at the time i had i had two choices so i had um the offer from animal logic to go and work on the owl movie and i also had an offer from uh sony to go and work on cloudy with a chance of meatballs in in la um my wife she wanted to go to la she's from Australia. She didn't want to come back to Australia. Uh, I didn't want to go to LA. I've been to LA quite a few times and I don't really like it. <laughs> I don't really want to live there. It's a nice place to visit, but I, I don't want to live there. Um, so uh, we had this choice of where do we, where do we go? I, I won that, that um, battle when we moved to Sydney to go work at Animal Logic. Um, at the time when Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs came out, I was like, ah, oh, that would have been a great show to work on because it's a really, really fun movie. Um, but coming to work at Animal was also, you know, it was fantastic. It was a really hard show doing the owls. There was a lot to learn in terms of um, anatomy and, and how birds fly and locomote. And, you know, we did a lot of, a lot of research on that show. Um, but I ended up staying at Animal, I don't know, quite a few years. Maybe Patricia knows how long I was there for, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> so I was at Animal for a few years. Can you remember you Patricia? Yeah. I had a break, right? I went <laughs> yeah. to work at Dr. D. Yeah. Right. You left us, but you know, nature of the business. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so, so I was at Animal, I went to work for Dr. D, we did Happy Feet 2. And then I came back to Animal to work on Walking with Dinosaurs, I think. Yeah. Um, so actually, I've got to say, when I went to work on Happy Feet 2, I, um, George Miller was like, he was like a walking encyclopedia of filmmaking. And at the time, to me, it felt like he was trying to record, trying to record everything he knew for prosperity. He, he filmed like a lot of his meetings that he had, put them all on tape, made them available for everyone. He would do these kind of impromptu masterclasses on filmmaking, just sit everyone down and talk them through, you know, how he made the first Mad Max or things like that. Um, and it was a really great experience to be able to sit even though I wasn't there for, for too long, but to be able to sit in a room with him and watch the way that he would deconstruct a shot and deconstruct a sequence and piece it all back together again. Um, and he would treat everyone exactly the same. It didn't matter who you were, he would give you the time of day to have a conversation. You could be the most junior junior, or you could be the animation supervisor. He would, he would talk to you in the same way he would look you in the eye, he would answer your questions. Uh, and, and it was a really, really good experience 
he, he's extremely frustrating. <laughs> he's a very frustrating guy because he is so, so specific about what he wants. And when he looks at your work, he divides the, he divides the screen into, into quadrants. And he'll look at this quadrant for a while and inspect it every pixel. And then he'll move over and he'll look at this quadrant for a while and he'll do the same and then he'll do that and then he'll do that and then he'll go back and look at the whole image. You know, so you, you kind of sit in silence for a while while he does all that and then he'll, then he'll give you his notes. Um, but he, he, knows, he knows what he's looking for and he's very specific about what he's trying to do. Um, so he, he kind of has this, this kind of magical effect on you. You can, before he comes in the room, you can be like, oh, George, why, why haven't you delivered the shot yet? Or why won't you approve this or whatever it is? And you can be frustrated with him. And then he walks into the room and says hello and looks at you and, and all of a sudden he's like your favorite guy in the whole world again. And you just can't wait to hear what he's got to say. And he kind of puts you under this magical spell. And then he walks out of the room and you realize your shot hasn't been approved. <laughs> Damn it, George, why didn't you approve my shot? Um, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was really good. And it was one of those things where, you know, you get the opportunity to, to work with someone. You just need to absorb as much as you can. You know, you need to just take it all in and learn everything you can from them while you've got, while you're in the room with them. Um, and then, and then remember it. I think a, a big thing is, is, you know, as an animator, you, you observe the world around you, right? Like you, you know, I love just sitting in airports. I've done quite a lot of travel over the past couple of years, going to sets and whatever. But, you know, I, I love being in an airport and just watching people and looking at them and looking at the way they interact with each other. And I think you need to do that as well with the people that you meet in terms of your career. You know, when you, when you see people who, who've been doing this job for a long time or, you know, whatever it is, whether they're, you know, environment artist or a, or a cinematographer or a director or a producer or whoever, but people who've been doing it for a long time, like look at them and, and see what they do and see how they operate and see how they move themselves around the room, see how they enter a meeting and how they navigate their way through it and how they, you know, how they interact with the people through the meeting. Because there's so much to learn from these people that you can then bring into the way that you work and it's only going to benefit you as a as an artist and also as a as a professional and then you know the people that you work with in this industry that moves around the world and we all see each other again and again and again there's people that you know i first worked with 20 years ago that crop up in meetings or i want a zoom call or something and, and it's that person that i saw all those years ago so you, you will see these people again so you know it's making sure that when you interact with them you're doing it in a in a positive way that's beneficial to everyone um, because yeah it is it's still a very small industry the animation industry and you do see a lot of the same faces over and over again um, okay so that's animated features so we've gone doodling cartoons um, computer games Animated features. Um, so let's let's look at another thing. Let's look at some more images. Um, dun -dun. I'm just going to keep talking until someone says stop. Okay. Um, can you see see this Lego? Yeah. So. Whoop. So came back to Animal and then um, after working on Walking with Dinosaurs, Lego arrived. Um, and Animal ended up doing quite a few Lego movies. It became a really successful thing for Animal Logic and a, and a really successful thing in terms of box office. Um, Matt, can you make that full screen, please? Yeah. There we go, is that better? Much better, thank you. Um, so, animated Lego. Animated Lego is is surprisingly hard. It's really difficult, and it looks so simple. And it should be so simple when you when you hold a little Lego minifig. And I've still 
I've still got I've still got my desk covered in Lego because I love Lego so much that I've still got it everywhere all over my all over my little office. Um, but Lego is like it's like animating in stop motion, but you're animating in CG. So you're often animating on twos or fours or sixes or eights. Um, you're doing kind of like um, little cheats of, of removing arms and pulling them out of their sockets and placing them over the front of the Lego pieces to cover up the little holes. Because we, we created and we had so many rules that were one set by Lego, the company, and two rules that we created for ourselves in terms of the aesthetic of what we were allowed to do. Uh, one was that we would never show any holes in the Lego piece themselves. We would always cover them up. Uh, we would never have any motion blur, so it was always stop motion. Unless we had something like this, which was this um, cat in frame, then that would be that would be motion blurred, but the, um, the Lego minifigs wouldn't be. And these really shallow depths of field to kind of create this miniature feeling to the work. Um, Oh, oh, this is one exception to the rule. Lego allowed us for this one show, for this one sequence when Lloyd has his arm uh, removed to show the hole in the side of the minifig. I think this was the only time we were allowed to do it because it was such a specific joke in the movie. Um, so yeah, the, the, the goal of animating Lego was to make it look simple, but we were, we were still kind of aiming for this sort of perfection within the rules of what we've created for ourselves. Um, and we would go through every shot. We had a review on every shot after it was approved where I would sit with the animators and we would frame by frame. I've been through it for this movie, Lego Ninjago movie. I've been through every single frame of the movie, one frame at a time, looking for <laughs> plastic penetrating through plastic because that was a rule that we set for ourselves. And, and to try and not have the audience see that happen. Um, but it was a really fun experience because it was like you had a, an entire box of, of Lego to play with. We had every Lego piece ever made available to us in the computer that we could just import into the scene and add to make, uh, we would do kind of like fake motion blur. I don't know if we've got any in here where we would use like multiple legs to create like blur frames. Um, we would use, you know, legs as arms and arms as legs and um, swap different bits and pieces around. Uh, and it was great because you, we were encouraged to experiment and we were encouraged to pitch ideas. And it was a, a real best ideas wins kind of, um, kind of situation on all of these films. Uh, we would, the, the facial was done with kind of replacing mouth shapes as well. So we almost had like these little stickers that you could stick on the face that we could, we could replace to kind of give it more of a kind of handmade stop motion film. And that was a, that was a, a direct thing from the kind of the, the guardians of Lego, these guys called uh, Chris and Phil, you know, they wanted it to feel handmade. They wanted it to feel like Imagine a kid was doing a stop motion film in his basement, but he had an unlimited budget. budget. That was the goal for the, um, for the projects. Um, so I was, I, uh, for Lego Ninjago, I was promoted to be animation director on that. So that was basically looking after the animation for the whole movie. Everything animated was kind of, my responsibility in the film. Um, and I worked on Ninjago for four years, probably. I was involved in the, in the pitch to win the job. So I, I worked on that. And then we got the green light to do the movie. I had to do an interview with the director. The director used to work at Passion Pictures. And that was a, a very big help because I also used to work at Passion Pictures. So we had a, a link, which was great. So I could, we could talk about that. 
think that kind of helped help convince him that I should uh, I should get the job. We worked on the movie, then Lego Batman was moved forward, so we paused on the movie. We did a little bit of help on Lego Batman, that came out, and then we went to, to finish off Lego Ninjago. Um, and it was it was a huge, huge, huge learning experience in terms of looking after a crew. I had uh, a crew of animators in Sydney, I had a crew of animators in Vancouver as well. So we had Animal, Animal Logic in Vancouver at the time. I would do some trips over there to, to meet the animators in Vancouver. Um, and it was like my clock never really stopped running because when, uh, when Australia was asleep, Vancouver was awake. So it was like there was constantly work being made and my brain never really stopped for that whole that whole back end of that production, um, but it was it was learning learning how to delegate responsibility because I had two leads in Vancouver with two teams I think it was and I had four teams in Sydney. Each team has approximately ten to twelve animators. Each team has a, a lead and a coordinator. So the leads job is to keep that team moving forwards. This is what I always say to animation leads, your job is to keep the work moving. And an animation lead does whatever they need to do to keep the work moving forwards. That can be uh, helping animators solve technical problems, it can be animating shots, it can be fixing issues, it can be helping to do schedules, it can be whatever they need to do to keep the work moving, that's, that's your job. So as an animation director, you know, I, I have to kind of let go a little bit and allow the leads to look after their teams, allow the, the teams and the leads to express themselves, still within the confines of what the show needs, but everyone should feel like they're allowed to have a creative idea and they're allowed to pitch it and they're allowed to try and express themselves. And then if within the boundaries of what the show is, we can accommodate it, or if it's a good idea or it's the best idea for the shot or the sequence, then you know, it's, it's my job to help put their best work on screen and if, put their ideas on screen and then sell those to the director. Um, yeah, I mean, an animation director or an animation supervisor, I don't think there's any difference between the two things, to be honest. Your, your job is to help facilitate the best animation on screen. So the director tells you what their vision is for the shot or for the, for the sequence. And then you have to go away and try and, you know, whether it can be putting certain animators on, on certain sequences or, or helping to, to give briefs or drawing on the work and scribbling on the work to help improve silhouettes or the flow of action or, or whatever it is. But it's the animation uh, director's job is to, is to help facilitate getting that, getting that work on screen. And for Lego, it's a, it's, it's a really fun thing because people can, can come up with ideas and, and add Lego pieces into their shot and say, what about this? And you can animate very, very quickly. You can rough out your work in a really, really quick, quick kind of almost like sketching kind of style, get the idea out, get it in front of the director. And if the director likes it, then you go away and you do all your little bits of polish and you know, fine bits of finesse. Um, which is, I suppose, another, another key thing to remember is you know, when I'm talking about sharing your work and sharing it with people is to not be too precious with it, you know, because shots get cut all the time, stories change, scripts change. I haven't worked on a single movie where, you know, at the last minute the script hasn't changed and we've had to cut shots and we've had to remove shots or change the idea behind a shot. Uh, you know, and if, if, if you're hanging on to your work, like, no, it's mine and it, it you know, it has to stay this forever, then you, you're not going to survive very long because we all need to be open to making the movie the best it can be. It's not about the shot being the best it can be, it's about the movie being the best it can be. And we don't own the movie, the studio owns the movie. The studio is putting up the money, it's theirs, they can do what they want with it. So, you know, when the studio says we want you to cut that shot, you know, I mean, you can you can fight the case and you can say, well, I think this shot could, should be in this movie for whatever reason. But at the end of the day, it's 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 theirs. And there's a a screenwriting term called um, it's called kill all your darlings or kill your babies. And it means that sometimes you have to kill your favorite thing. 
Um, and I've done it writing scripts as well, where you have a scene that you think is the best scene you've ever written, but it just doesn't make the story better. And you just have to put a line through it and throw it in the bin and, and move on. Um, so, so we've got to animated features. So the next step, kind of the, the current step is um, VFX. So I think, again, I think I got to a, a point where I wanted to try and broaden my skill set. I wanted to go on set. That was something I'd never done before. I wanted to be part of an actual physical film set. And I wanted to experience that and see what that's like and learn about how to be on set. Um, so I, I made the decision to move away from animated features and move into visual effects. Um, and visual effects often, you know, you're, you're often dealing with CG, working within a live action environment or a live action component. You know, you're bringing in plates, you're applying your CG to the plates and then re-delivering it for the movie. Um, so I went to work on something that was far opposite from Lego as you can possibly get. Um, let me share my screen again. I went to work on this. So this is Outlaw King. I'm just gonna let it play in the background. Um, so shot in Scotland, um, all live action. Uh, it's about uh, this guy, Robert the Bruce, who fought the English. Um, Robert, I think, let's have a look back here. So Robert the Bruce, he had um, an army of like a couple of hundred. If there's a shot of his army. And the English had an army of thousands. And this, the Scots won. So the, the brief for this was to recreate um, a live action battle of people getting stabbed and heads chopped off and blood and guts and gore and, and people on horseback. So probably about as far away from Lego as you can get. And that was something that really appealed to me was to, was to completely do a, a huge shift in terms of tone and style and technique and in terms of, you know, understanding um, the mechanics of, of the horse and a rider and how that works and, and how you make a visual effects for a live action movie. So we spent a lot of time um, understanding horse anatomy, horse gates, how they move, how they locomote. We went to a stables. We looked at um, horses close up just to try and get a feeling of the, the mass and the size and the weight of them. Uh, we did a lot of research in terms of the, the riding styles, people back then in terms of how they sat in the saddle um, and how they manipulated the, the weapons that they carried, you know, the kind of weapons that they had. Apologies if this is too gory for anyone. It's pretty brutal. Um, and basically, you know, the restrictions that they had on, on set meant that they could only have a couple of, of real horses actually in the environment because of, you know, the health and safety of the animals. So the majority of, of animals that you're seeing in here, this, this horse, can, I don't know if you can see my cursor, this horse here, this is a prosthetic horse. On a, on a winch. Well, it actually, it actually had like a little kind of pneumatic piston down here underneath it. If you look at it, it's, it's not real at all. It's very, very fake. Um, but then it's got a CG head on the top. So we, we chopped off the body across the top, animated the head, and the rest is live action plate, but it's a prosthetic horse that this guy was sat on. So there's a lot of that going on in the set. You know, in this shot, this guy in the foreground is live action. Everything else behind him is, is CG. Um, so we created, um, let it run in the background. We created a lot of uh, cycles. 
uh, of horse animation. So we, we didn't have a crowd system at the time. We needed to make a crowd system. I was in charge of, of the crowds as well as the hero animation. So we, we created individual uh, motion cycles for, for the horses for you know, walking, trotting, um, cantering, gallop. We created all the motion that would link up all of these different pieces of motion and we could piece them all together in the computer and we can make cycles and we can make crowds to interact. Um, so we had you know, turning motions, jumping motions, almost like kind of a computer game sort of methodology. Um, we created a whole lot of fighting vignettes where we would have, you know, four riders, two Scots, two English fighting in a little vignette. And then we could place those vignettes uh, within the scene, slide around the time. So, so they all look slightly different and layer them on top of each other. So it looks like it's, it's lots of different individual things happening within the shot where actually it's just a few different vignettes playing different parts of the action layered together. And then when you cut it all into the movie, your eye doesn't really have time to kind of see what's going on and to understand that, oh, that action there is actually the same as that action in the, another shot, you know, but just seen from a slightly different angle. So it was trying to come up with all these different solutions in terms of, you know, you get the feeling of this giant melee, this giant brawl without having to individually animate, you know, 2000 English people on, on 2,000 horses and, you know, a few hundred Scots. Um, it was, um, when I mean vignettes, do I mean vignettes like crowds of people? Yeah, so a vignette, we, we call a vignette like a, a little kind of staged um, setup of, of action. So a, a vignette could be, it could be like two people walking towards each other, they have a conversation, they turn around and they, and they walk away. And you can save that as a little kind of self-contained, you know, piece of action that you can then place in different scenes. So for an animated vignette, that's what, that's what we would call it. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of learning of, of horse gates, horse muscles. Um, yeah, horses are probably one of the hardest things I think to animate. They're, they're, they're so peculiar in the way that they locomote and so specific in the way that they locomote. They're so delicate, but also really beautiful in the way that they can, they can move around a space. Um, so to get the musculature correct, for how the, the muscles would move as the as the horse would locomote and how its chest muscles would, would interact with its with its shoulder and, it, and its leg as it would move through the scene. You know, it's one of those things where you, it's an opportunity to learn about something that you're actually getting paid to kind of, you know, learn all this really, really interesting, well, I think it's interesting, interesting information. Um, so it was a it was a great show. It was really good and it was kind of it was me also understanding more about visual effects. Um, so then in, in terms of, uh, another thing for you. Do another screen share. So then in, in terms of, um, in terms of being on set, I went to work on this film. So this film is uh, is Dora. Let's turn the volume down. This was all shot in uh, in Queensland, uh, and I was on set for this for the shoot. This is when I started at uh, what was Mill Film and is now Mister X. So when I started at the company, I, I didn't come to the office. I just went straight to the set uh, up in Queensland. Put me up in a little hotel by the beach, which was nice. Um, and yeah, we shot all around, there's a place called Mount Tambourine, all around the Gold Coast on sound stages. Well, I'll just play it through and then I'll talk through a, a few little things. And this, the style of this movie is it's a it's cartoon CG with live action actors. So the, the, the director, a guy called James Bobin, he wanted his, his cartoon characters to feel cartoony. 
um, even though they've got this kind of like photoreal fur and things like that. But the whole premise and setup of the movie is completely daft. So we wanted to kind of embrace that. Okay, let's talk through a little bit of this. Um, so my, 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 my golden rule, my guide for being on set is if you ever get to work on a, on a film set, you should be invisible until you're needed. And when you're needed, you should be ready to, to go quickly. Um, a film set is a, everyone on, on the set has a very specific job to do. They're, they're all very good at their job, but it's a, it's a, it can be a very cramped and chaotic, which is one reason why we're having so much trouble getting film sets moving again because of COVID, because of the, the environment that we work in is often, you know, it's, it's very, very confined and chaotic. Lots of people rubbing shoulders with each other. Um, but you, you, you need to stay out of the way until your, your part of the job is needed and then you need to be kind of ready and to spring into action and solve the problems. So this, this was shot in Queensland. This day that we shot this, it must have been 40 something degrees. We were in this tin shed. We actually shot this on location. Let's see if we can find a wide shot of the tin shed. this thing here we actually we filmed the interior scenes of this scene in this shed and we, we the entire crew was in there and it was like 40 degrees and we were all in there and we were sweating and it was horrific but good fun at the same time <laughs> um so this is this is all fake behind them that's all the uh, uh, matte painting behind them that's not really there that was all crappy scrubland And the way that you would the way that you would do this scene, you would run this scene through with stand-in. So every actor in the movie has a stand-in who looks kind of similar to the main actor, same height, same skin tones. Um, so they come in, they run through the scene so we can get the lighting correctly. My job on set is whenever there's a shot with uh, CG animation that's going to be integrated into, into the shot. I need to be there to to help describe what the character is going to do in the shot. So sometimes I'll be manipulating puppets. Sometimes I'll have like um, a cardboard cutout of, of the character. I'll be just out of frame. I'll have my hand up. I'll be pretending to be the character. I, I'm kind of there as the representation of the animated character. So I need to be able to perform as well, which is... Um, <laughs> It's amazing you suddenly feel the pressure when you've got an entire crew stood there watching you, waiting for you to perform with the actors while they're um, running through their lines. So they kick open the door. This is all fake. We'll see G out here. Um, this was done. So as he jumps over her back here and pulls off her backpack, we, we had the backpack set up over her shoulder. So we had the straps kind of loose. We had um, rope pulleys set up to the top of the backpack and the stuntman would yank on the pulley and that would pull off her backpack. But then every time they would do it, they would then look at me and say, well, can the animated character do that? Is the timing right? And I would say, well, it needs to be kind of a little bit quicker or you need to frame like this because the the character is going to do this action through the shot, is going to spin and pirouette. So can we get this kind of camera move or your eye line needs to be here because the character is going to be doing this. Uh, this shot where it runs down the wing, I had a cardboard cutout on a, on a bit of on a fishing pond and I would run down the set to give the camera operator and the actors a guide of, of the timing, motion and how to frame what was going to happen. This is the uh, stunt lady. Oop, there, that's the stunty. That's the stunty. But it was the, yeah, it was the hottest day, I think, in Queensland. Um, 
you know, all these giant fans kind of just off the edge of frame trying to blow cool air in, but it just didn't work. Um, so things like this, this propeller is, that she goes under is completely CG. Um, some of the aircraft is completely CG as well. Um, some of the props in the background are CG. Um, this propeller is CG, yeah. So, so Dora, yeah, we, we shot the whole thing in Queensland. Um, the director is, is English um, and he, he returned back to the UK uh, to finish the film. Um, and I would, I would do trips from Adelaide to the UK to spend time with the director to look at the work and then come back, um, back to Adelaide. We also had some animators in London working on the show too. Uh, and I think last thing before we kind of wrap up and you can ask some questions and I'll have a quick drink of water. We did a thing on this show called Sketchviz. And this was um, kind of me going back to my 2D animation roots because we were, we were looking at the film and we were building the assets for the characters and the, the director, uh, he, he wanted to be able to see his animated characters in the frame with, with the actors and he didn't know how, how to best express what the animation was going to look like with the actors. And I, I pitched this thing, which I called Sketchers, which is, you know, animators drawing on the plate and we were drawing like, you know, tens or twelves or something like that. So very blocky animation, but we would just go over and we would draw because it's a lot quicker to just draw something on a frame than it is to, you know, wait for all of the assets to get built and get rigged and get furred and all those things. So we had this team called Sketchfiz team, which was these um, 2D animators that we had in London. And I would, I would kind of brief them on what the action needed to be. They would draw in frame what it was going to look like. We would present that to the director and then he would present that to the studio. So they had a cut of the movie with all this sketch piece in there. Um, and then he would kind of get an idea and a flavor for what the animation was going to be. We'd be able to get a buy off on it. And then when we go to animate the shot for real, we've got a better idea of what we're trying to achieve and the style and tone and expressions and mannerisms that, uh, that he was trying to hit. So, it kind of came, you know, that experience and that willingness to, to do things in an old fashioned way with a pencil and just drawing on things kind of came back full loop. So I would say to, to kind of wrap up that whole journey, um, the, the key thing across, across my career, I think has been one of adaptability and one of willingness to learn new things. I've always been open to, to change and change trajectory and change path in terms of, you know, what I'm trying to do, but then also be open to, to taking advice and learning from people who've done it before and, you know, had that experience before to kind of bring it into my um, skill set and, and broaden my horizons in terms of what I'm what I'm trying to do and what, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a, a better filmmaker at the end of the day. It's something I love and it's something I'm passionate about. Um, you know, it's always had that animation component within it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's learning about how to make films and how to interact with people to make films. And so now, yeah, like I say, I executive produce things and I, I write things and help develop projects and, and advise on, on projects, but it's still all within this realm of, of filmmaking because uh, that's what I enjoy. And hopefully I've got another 25 years of um, doing the same thing. I think that's the end of my long <laughs> journey. Thanks Matt. No, there's certainly stuff I didn't even know about you and I've, I've known you for a <laughs> while. So that was awesome. Um, I think hopefully because there's not a huge amount of questions, but um, from previously, maybe because everyone was listening to you, but anyone, you know, feel free to, I mean, there's, there's not a huge amount of us. So feel free to turn on your camera and ask Matt a question 
face to face, um, if you like. So while we're waiting for some questions, I mean, yeah, Jessica said that's a lot of work. And, and I guess that's the thing, isn't it? That people take it for granted, well, not take it for granted, but they're unaware of how much goes into, into something like a, even a, a short animated feature or a short visual effects film or a full animated feature. So there's, there's certainly a lot of planning and it sounds like, you know, what you said, research is key, planning, adapting to your different directors because you've worked with so many different directors now who had varying backgrounds. Um, do, what do you think is the common thread when you're, like you, you touched on at the beginning, that you're working with people who, you know, they, they're all different. But what do you think is perhaps the thing that the, the key to working with so many disparate um, personalities and knowledge of visual effects or animation? I think that, I mean, working with different directors, the, the key to begin with is to try and tap in to what makes them tick and find some commonality between us in terms of, you know, sometimes it can be like the smallest thing. With, with James Bobin doing Dora, it was, it was, he had this very English sense of humour and it was something I could relate to, you know. So that, that was the, the common ground between us. But then, you know, working, working with um, the director of, of, of Lego, you know, we didn't have that, but he had this love of a certain style of filmmaking. And that was something that I then took the time to learn myself, you know, learn about myself he was a big Kurosawa fan and I was like, right, I need to know more about this because that's his thing. And that's where we can find that, that common ground. So it's trying to find, yeah, there's always something I think that you can relate to with, you know, various different people. And then, and then what, I think once you kind of open up that tap a little bit, then it, it starts to, it starts to flood out. Um, Jessica's asked, uh, were you, where were you, most happy at? Um, like, did you prefer one company over the other? And which specific job type did you like the most? Visual effects, games, movies, advertising? That's a tricky um, question. I, I think I always like the current one in terms of the, the, the style of work, because it's normally the one where I've got the most still to learn. So I like, um, you know, what I'm doing now in terms of visual effects is, um, is great and it's different things for different parts of different times in your life as well you know like I, I don't want to do crazy overtime anymore because you know I'm not at that point in my life and I honestly don't think anyone should do crazy overtime but at the time when I did do it in my 20s I did it because I enjoyed it and I did it because I enjoyed being part of the group and it was it was fun um, but <laughs> Having said that, when I deal with my own crews, you know, I don't want them to work crazy hours, but I did enjoy it at the time, I've got to say. Um, I think, I think, I think do, going to Passion Pictures and, and getting to work with someone who was my hero when I was a teenager was a big thing because, you know, just as an artist, he, Jamie Hewlett was someone that I, I really liked and, you know, it's one of those... I don't generally get starstruck struck with people. I meet, you know, meet people on set or whatever, and I don't generally get starstruck, but with him I did. I think that leads in really nicely to Jacinta's question, which is, do you still do a lot of creative work in your downtime or do you reserve this energy mostly for jobs? And how do you personally keep a healthy work-life balance? Um, I was taught quite a big lesson about the healthy work-life balance about two years ago. I used to I used to work all day, come home, work all night, and I've been doing that ever since I first graduated. And then about two years ago, I got I got ill. I got very very ill, and um, I ended up in hospital. But I was still trying to kind of keep going and working, working, working. And it was that experience of of, of ending up in hospital and, and being quite ill that made me change you know that balance a little bit so i still you know i still do extra things but i don't do it anywhere near to the volume that i used to like i enjoy doing things like this i enjoy you know talking about the industry and i enjoy looking at people's work and 
looking at people getting into the industry in terms of what they're creating. I still enjoy writing. I do a lot of writing. Um, but I definitely manage that balance a lot better than I used to. But it, it's, just, it's, it's a shame that it took something that was such a slap in the face to, to make me appreciate that I need to work a little bit less. But I am a little bit of a workaholic, I think. I guess that's one of those things, though, that um, what I certainly find with people in the industry, of because you're so passionate about it and you love it so much that you don't really think about the work and you just want to do it because you, you, you just want to continue on. So, yeah. And I, I think your story is quite, unfortunately, maybe um, similar to a lot of people's stories where they just, they just keep going until, unfortunately, that there's something that happens that makes them stop. But it's, it's also... You know, just because you do stop doesn't mean that you can't continue being creative. Like you said, you just find different outlets or different ways of doing it. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm a lot better at managing my time now than I used to be as well. Like I do specifically, you know, that there's, there's time where I, I don't do anything, anything extra at all. I, and I, I make a, a, a commitment to, to doing that and making sure I have that, that separate time, you know, um, it's hard. <laughs> um, and this question is from Sabe. I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, are there anything? Are there any things in the industry right now, in particular, uh, right now, in particular, studios are looking for in portfolios? Also, any other tips to get a good foot in the door? Oh, thanks. I pronounced it right. Um, also, thank you for taking the time for this masterclass. Has been awesome. Oh, that's lovely. Um, but yes, I, I think Sabe's question is. Is very pertinent that everyone wants to know, you know, any tips on on what to do in terms of portfolios and what studios might be looking for. Okay, you, you might have heard some of this before. Um, <laughs> so my 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 key thing, my key thing, when you're animating something, animate you, because there's no other you in the in the world, right? So animate something that is specific to you. If you want to stand out. And it makes something that is, it is about you and it's about what you care about. And if you do that and you put that on screen, then that piece of work will be individual and specific to you and it will be like nothing else anyone has done. So think about what you care about and what you like and what you want to say. And it can be the shortest, simplest little clip. But if you do something like that, rather than looking at what other people are doing in terms of their reels and copying that, I would rather see something individual and specific that that is interesting than than you know dinosaurs or, or whatever it is, because you know when I'm recruiting, so at our peak, so we went from um, there were four of us when we started Mill Film. A year later, I had 110 animators, so I interviewed this huge number of people. But what I was looking for in in all of those people was not an identikit, you know, same, 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 same. I want to find individual people. And I want to find people who are, you know, specific to, to their point of view on, on telling stories and people from different parts of the world. And, you know, I want to find all these people. And yes, I want them to all work together, but I want individuals and I want people with their own voice. Um, so if you can animate something like that, that speaks to your voice, then I think it will, that's what I would look for in a show. Cool. Um, Patrick is asking, was it easy to change studios, countries like you, you did a lot? I mean, what um, were your criteria to choose to, in choosing them? And thanks for your time. Um, I think more often than not, it's the people that you interview with. You know, if you interview with some, that. <laughs> But it's true, right? If you have, if you interview with someone and you have a connection with them and and they seem like honest people, and when you're talking, they're actually listening to you in the interview. You feel like when you actually start there, you're going to be heard, and they're going to they're going to you know care about you. Like every single person I've hired, I I want the best for them. So when I go to interview, I want the person who's interviewing me. I want to get that feeling that they're they're going to you know pay an interest in my career. Um, and then, you know, it comes down, 
you know, you don't always have the choice. Sometimes you just have to take the gig because you have to earn a living. And there's that reality to it. Um, but then when you do get the gig, you just have to make the best of it and, and find the best within that opportunity that you can. Um, and sometimes it's just it's because you just want to work on something that is drawn by someone that you loved when you were 15. So, yeah, there's lots of different things. I think. How do you find, um, I mean, it, it sounds like you've been really fortunate. I don't want to say lucky because I think you've worked really hard to, to get that luck and and put yourself in those situations. But like you said, when you're moving from um, passion pictures and then to uh, Tales of Despero and Frame Store, that it was quite difficult because obviously you're moving from um, TV work into animated features and finding that a bit frustrating. How have you felt, um, how have you dealt with, you know, frustrations, be it that, you know, it's not a great project or it's not what you thought it would be, or it's this transition. Um, what has helped you get through that? I think I was, I think I was absolutely terrible at dealing with those frustrations for a long time in my career, for a long time. And I think I had to take a bit of a look at myself in terms of how I interacted with people. And, and I think sometimes I, I wanted things to be, to be, because I'm a bit of a perfectionist, to be perf perfect so much that I, I got frustrated with the process rather than just accepting sometimes the process for it is what it is, you know, and you can do your best within the confines of it. But sometimes, you know, the, the, the whole thing is, is bigger than what you are and you just have to, you know, accept it. But then I kind of made a decision that as I move further and further up in my career, then I've got more opportunity to help shape those environments and make them better for people and make the processes better or, or whatever it is. Um, but I think for a long time, I, I, I would get too frustrated, for sure. <laughs> Fair enough. That's the honest answer. <laughs> no, appreciate it. Because um, you, you know, you've, you've given quite a good history even of the, the evolution of animation from 2D um, games, uh, commercials, animated features and visual effects. In your mind, um, you know, what do you think the landscape's going to look like um, in the future, in the coming years for animation or filmmaking? Like, what do you think the future of work's going to look like? I think due to what's been going on in the past six months, there's going to be a lot more animated features because that's a very safe way to make films right now. You know, you can make an animated feature and, and no one needs to leave the house, you know, so... I think the reality of it, which as animators, that's a good thing, but I hope that it means that we actually get to make more individual and different kinds of work. And it isn't just a, a cookie cutter, rinse and repeat, let's all copy Pixar type work. So I, I definitely think there's going to be more of that. I think there's going to be a lot more, if you look at the Mandalorian and the way that they shot with the virtual um, studios, so the, the virtual backdrops. I think that is, and in terms of using Unreal and the game engines, that is going to swamp the industry because right now everyone's trying to learn it and everyone's thirsty to learn more about that. So having that that game knowledge, as well as as well as the the traditional knowledge, I think is of is of use. Um, I I hope. I, I, just, I just want I just want more female directors. That's what I hope. <laughs> well, I think we've got some awesome females in studying at JMC. That's for sure. <laughs> um, and I guess any other questions that come up? Not not yet. But um, you've given I mean you've given some great advice already to the students. But any sort of parting words and parting advice? for them as, as they, they go through, like from starting, I mean, um, Jessica is, is going to start in September and we've got people like Maddie and, and so forth who are in their final year. Um, any sort of key advice that you want to leave? Um, I think the, the 10,000 hours rule is actually a good one in terms of just spending the time creating. Um, <laughs> <you're graduating. laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, don't, don't be too precious of your work. 
you know, learn from your mistakes. So, you know, create something, create something quick, you know, don't spend eight years working on one project because by the time of that eight years, you're a different person to when you were at the start. So make something rough, make something quick, look at it, learn from it, put it to one side and then do another one. You know, there's a film studies class in, um, in New York. I was listening to a, a podcast with Bill Pope and uh, Roger Deakins, two cinematographers. I listen to a lot of um, podcasts about filmmaking. And uh, Bill Pope's film studies class, they would make a, a different film every week. And we just, it was just this, do something, create it, move on. What did you learn? Do it again. What did you learn? Do it again. And I think that is a very valuable thing. And it teaches you not to be too precious, to share your work. I can't say that enough, is to share what you, what you create. Be proud of what you create. Learn from it and, and enjoy it. Because making films is the best job in the world. It should be anyway. So Matt, I don't know if you remember when we used to interview together, we would ask this one question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. should, we ask, should we ask that question of, of everyone that's here tonight? Go on then. All I right, thought everyone. Ask me. Oh, okay. Matt, what is your uh, favourite animated feature? Um, it used to be Toy Story 3. I don't know what it is now. Toy Story 3 is edited within a frame of its life to perfection. And there's something else. I watched, um, oh, I watched uh, My Neighbour Totoro with my daughter for the first time. And she absolutely loved it. So right now, that's probably my favourite, I think. It's great. Good choice. Actually, we have one more question <laughs> on. from Jasmine. Any tips for interviews? What are the interviewers looking for things not to do? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I like to do interviews in the same room as people, but I generally like to do I, I like to do dailies in the same room as people. And then as much as possible, I like to be in the same physical space as people. And I know it's difficult at the moment. So it's going to be a different kind of landscape for doing that. There's going to be a lot more of these kind of conversations, I think. Be yourself. Don't try to be someone else. It's, it's okay to make mistakes in the interview. No one, you know, no one is, is judging you that harshly that if you say the wrong thing or, you know, if you come in without your shoes on, you know, I honestly don't care. I just want you to be yourself. I want you to present you as you really are, if you can, because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people who are honest in, in who they are. Um, you know, we, we interviewed, I, I hired someone from South Korea and she, she could barely speak any English, but her passion for, for, animating was so obvious and I said to her in the interview like this is going to be difficult for you to, to do this move to come to a, you know a country that you it, this isn't your first language but she was so keen to do it I couldn't help but give her the job right because she was just like I just want to do it and that's you know if you come in with, with that kind of attitude then uh, great I'm just going to say the disclaimer shoes you do need to have shoes. It's an awareness <laughs> issue. Sorry, I have to put my HR hat on there. Um, so the question, everyone, that, that Matt and I would ask in interviews and would stump so many people is that question I just asked, Matt. What's your favourite animated feature? Um, and it doesn't just have to be one. It could be a few, like Matt had. But go. Like, people write, what's Anyone? your an favourite animated feature? And you won't be judged. There's actually only one that I kind of just... Currently, it's Onward. Nice. Okay. Uh, Into the Spider-Verse. Nice. Treasure Planet. Yeah. Good. Wow, there's some good ones. Uh, Into the, the Wind Rises, Fantastic Planet, Princess How to Train Your Dragon 3, Princess and the Frog. <laughs> Promar? I don't What's know. What's that one? What's Promar? Okay, Liam, you're going to have to um, I'm going to write this explain down. that to us or we'll have to look that up. Is that recent or... New Studio Trigger film. Okay. Hmm. Oh, Trigger Totoro's Studio. Good. Japan Studio. Studio. Poro? I don't know what that one is either. Or is that Ponyo? There's, there's yeah. lots, of, lots cool. of stuff to see that I haven't seen before. And, and this is also why 
Oh, I mean, trigger is ah, Yeah, it's right. Okay. Because there's actually a South African ponyo. Yeah, autocorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Damn autocorrect. Um, and this is why we would ask this question is because some of the films, we had no idea what they were. And, but we just wanted to hear um, people talk about why they liked it. Like Matt said, you know, hearing about that passion, even if there is a language barrier, um, you, you can always see that passion of people going, I love this film because of this, 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 this. And that sometimes told us so much more than, than the interviewee, the candidate up answering questions that we had about their process or, you know, their experience. When we, the, the most telling thing was whenever we asked this question. It's true, yeah. Because people, people would just generally open up more. As soon as they started talking about something that they, they loved, you could see that they were just a lot more comfortable, a lot more open. And some people, sometimes people just wouldn't, you know, they just talk for like five minutes, you know, just like, oh, this and this and this and this and this. Uh, yeah, it was great. Yeah, no, cool, I love that. Um, so I noticed that um, Ratatouille didn't appear, which is perhaps <laughs> the film that I don't particularly like, which a lot of people disagree with me about. But, you know, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Um, That's true. We got a lot of Ratatouille, a lot of Incredibles. Um, we did. Yeah. Yeah. So no, great, great selection. Um, well, Matt, thank you so much for your time. That was really insightful and entertaining and, and everyone um, thanks you. Um, so yep, just amazing to hear about your career and the fact that you're still learning and that you still have the passion um, and, you know, lots of great tips about research and being yourself, um, and, but working hard. So everyone says, thank you. Thank oh, you so thank much. you. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. It was great. Yeah, there were some things that I'd forgotten about. So, yeah, it was good. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Red wine helps, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and everyone, this will be, um, this has been recorded, so you can always go back and watch on um, Plato um, if there's anything you want to go back and um, rewatch, of course. So, everyone, Thanks so much also for joining us, um, James, you students, alumni and future students. Um, Matt, again, thank you. Enjoy your evening. I hope that whatever your daughters have cooked um, is... They're still fine. eating. So it can't, be, it can't be too bad. I hope there's some left for me. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone else, enjoy your evening. Um, and thanks again, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Patricia. Take care. <laughs> Take care. Bye.